okay, there's some manna from heaven falling here. I just feel it in the house. It's just filling our cup, just filling us up. Okay, our last speaker, but not least, is Mike Holmes. Come on up, Brother Mike. Encouragement was the, was the topic. So I batted this thing around for a couple weeks. Lord, what would you have me talk on? And how do you want to approach this? Who needs encouragement? Well, the first thought that comes to mind is all of us. Yeah. From, from the little bitty baby, when that baby is first born, he needs encouragement to talk. Yes. How many of you remember that when your son or your daughter first come around and you said, is he going to say mama first or is he going to say daddy first? Maybe you had a little competition there. Dada, mama. <laughs> so they need that encouragement to talk. They need that encouragement to crawl, yes. to walk to eat, to tie their shoes. They need that encouragement as they get older to ride the bike for the first time. How many of you remember teaching your children to ride their bikes? No, I just can't do that. But boy, you just keep encouraging them. And before you know it, you can't stop them. They're riding that bike all over the neighborhood. They need to be encouraged for the very first day of school. Anybody remember those days? Oh, yeah. Or how about to get on the school bus as they get older to ask for their first date? To drive a car? And the list goes on and on and on. And we still need that encouragement today. Everyone requires an encouragement, whether you're it's a parent encouraging their children, spouses, Encouraging one another, siblings, doctors, encouraging patients, singers, encouraging each other, speakers, encouraging each other, Christians, encouraging each other. Yes. In the Bible, as I was reading in the uh, book of Judges, it tells us about a lady prophetess, Deborah. And Deborah had told Barak that the Lord God of Israel commanded him to lead an attack against the forces of Jabin, king of Canaan. And the scripture goes on to tell us that Barak needed that encouragement. In fact, what did he say? He said, I'll go, but only if you go with me. I'm reminded when we go to church services all across the country, my prayer is always this. Father, send the Holy Spirit with me or I don't want to go. I don't want to stand up here. I don't want to sing unless the Holy Spirit is there. If the Holy Spirit shows up, we're in good shape. Amen. Amen. So we need that encouragement just, just as Brock did. Paul was an, was an encourager. Paul had an encourager by the name of Barnabas. Had it not been for Barnabas speaking up for Paul when he switched from Saul to Paul, there's no telling what would have happened to Paul. Where would the Bible be? The Lord would have had to get somebody else to write it, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah. Because Paul wrote a large portion of it. Because of the encouragement that he got. Jesus told his disciples, In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yeah. Jesus yeah. encouraged his disciples. Thanks, Are we not to encourage one another? Yeah. He, he spent a lot of his time teaching his disciples to encourage others. And they did. Thank the Lord. And we all struggle with discouragement. Amen? Did you know that Elijah even struggled with discouragement? He did. In the book of Kings, 19th chapter, 
Read it for yourself and find out. <clears throat> we must remind ourselves and our brothers that this is not a war against flesh and blood. This is a war against principalities and darkness. We need each other to encourage one another. I want to share a little story with you that may encourage you today. You know, God cares about the most minute details of our lives. And sometimes we have a tendency to think we serve a God that's way out there in the universe somewhere, that He's so big that He doesn't care, He doesn't worry about our little minute details. We need to rethink that. Because just as, just as you care about every single little thing that happens to your child, God cares about us Amen. that same way. Amen. I don't care if you have 12 children or if you have one. You know about that child and you care about that child. If that child gets a little scrape, you want to know about it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Because you might need to take that child to a doctor and get that hand put in a cast. <laughs> so you care about that child or those children. And it doesn't matter. If you have 12 of them, you know what each one of them needs. What their needs are. And if they're hurt, what it is. I had a mole on my face about the size of a pencil eraser, and I'd had it for several years. My brother had gone and had some skin cancers removed, and my wife and I was talking one day, and we said, this is looking pretty bad. The coloration is not, not right, it's not looking healthy. Need to go to this doctor that my brother had and get it removed. So I set an appointment, and we went down I went down that morning, walked into the office, and I walked up to the window to sign in, and I said, uh, this is a cash pay, self-pay, so I need to make sure that I have enough cash on me. What's it going to cost to have this thing removed? Now, I remind you, it's about the size of a pencil eraser, and I've had it for some time. And the lady behind the counter said, Real hateful. She evidently got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning. She said, well, it's going to cost 300 to get the doctor to look at you. It's going to cost another 300 to have it removed. And then it's going to cost another 300 to have it analyzed. <clears throat> and then it's going to cost another three. I said, stop right there. Cancel this appointment. I'm out of here. And I got back in my truck and I headed back to the farm. And I'm mad. I'm just fussing. I said, this is a cowboy church and I can say, the, I can say this here. I said, if she worked for me, I'd fire her butt right now. <laughs> I was so mad. And we had a lot of employees at that time. So we taught our employees how you treat your customers. And that's not how you treat them. So anyhow, about halfway home, I realized, okay, you still have the same problem. What are you going to do about it? Folks, I happen to believe that God meant every single word in that book called the Bible. So I said, okay, Father God, in the name of your son Jesus, you said, ask and you shall receive. You didn't say you might receive. You said you shall receive. I'm asking you to remove this thing from my face. Now, you either meant what you said or you didn't. I happen to believe you did. So I'm asking you to remove this thing. And furthermore, I'm asking you to do it before the sun comes up tomorrow morning. Thank you. 
So about that time, my truck pulls into the driveway, and I get out, and I walk in the house. And Denise is back at the far end of the house, and she says, well, you're home early. What'd you do, walk out? <laughs> Guilty. She knows me pretty well. I'm not real patient. I said, yeah, but you've got to hear how rude this, this lady was. And I told her what happened. She said, yeah, that's pretty rude. But, Mike, you still got the mole. You know and I know you got to get to the doctor, so we got to get you another doctor. I said, are you taking care of it? Thank you. Really? Oh. That quick? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what's his name? I said, Dr. Jesus. And I began to tell her what I had told Jesus and what our conversation was. And folks, when you pray, make it personal. Sometimes we, we think that we're praying to outer space. And He's really not going to hear us. Sometimes we ask amiss. Bible says. Sometimes we pray without expectation. And we're all guilty of it. But that moment, I prayed and I believed. I prayed without doubt. And the Bible says, pray and doubt not. The next morning, I went to bed that night fully, fully expecting to see that mold gone the next morning. Well, the next morning, the sun started peeping through the curtains. I jumped out of bed. And I rushed into the bathroom and looked in the mirror, and it was still there. And I'll never forget it. I said, you said, you said, ask and you shall receive. And I believe you. So why is this sucker still here? Never forget. Every time I'd walk by the mirror that day, I'd touch that thing on my face. And I'd say, I believe it's getting smaller. Amen. For the next five days, I'd walk by the mirror and I'd look in the mirror and I'd say, I believe it's getting smaller. I believe it's getting smaller. And I'm telling you, and I will take a polygraph test if you want, I'll be happy to. On the fifth day, it was the size of a grain of sand. And I reached up and I brushed it off. Praise God. He loves you just as much as He loves me. This is a boast about my Heavenly Father who loves you and cares about every single minute detail of your life. We have to get ourselves to a point that we trust Him with everything. Everything. We're going to have prayer here in a few minutes. We need to have that kind of belief, that kind of knowing that Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit will reach out and touch and heal today just like He did 2,000 years ago. He hasn't changed. We've changed. As I'm preparing for this, the Lord pointed something, something out to me that I wouldn't have thought of. And He does that with me a lot of times. Sometimes He says, I want you to write a song. And one time He said, I want you to write a song about the sandals that Jesus wore. I said, what? How do you write a song about the sandals that Jesus wore? But when He writes it, it turns out pretty good. Amen. So, the other day, he says, I want you to talk about David's sheep. David's sheep. Wow, okay. You know, we talked a little bit about Elijah struggled with discouragement. Don't you know that David's sheep, that he was, he was over, that they were fearful, Because David slew a bear. David killed a lion. Can you imagine that 
as animals like that would come into the herd, don't you know that the, the sheep feared for their lives, for their safety? And yet, God took that time to teach David. He was in school all that time because he had a much bigger job to do. He had to, he had to get down amongst the sheep for God to teach him that that he had to have, had to have that knowledge. He had to have that experience throwing that, throwing that sling. He had to have a lot of practice. <laughs> Amen. Are you today in school? Yeah. Has God got you in school somewhere? Yeah. Teaching Amen. you how to sling that sling? Sling, sling it? Huh? Sling? So, uh, and they were moving targets that he killed. So as Goliath stood there, big and boastful and still, he was no obstacle for David. He just thought he was. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a Goliath in your life? You think he's too big for God? He's not too big for God. You just begin to tell that Goliath how big your God is. Yes. He's the creator of this earth, of this universe, of all the other universes that we don't even know about. That's how big our God is. And yet, He cares about the most minute details of your life. Amen. That's my God. David stood before Goliath with confidence. Why? Because... He wasn't a moving target. He was a piece of cake for David because David had run the course. He had run the race. He had finished the course. You see, God allowed that bear and that lion to attack David's sheep as part of his training. God has, God had a plan that would require that confidence, that skill. Whatever ministry that you're involved in today, and I'm talking to preachers, I'm talking to singers, I'm also talking to those of you that are holding down a steady job somewhere else, and you you may think you're not in the ministry. Wrong. You're in the ministry. Amen. Wherever you're at, God's got you there for a reason. Today, I want to encourage you to go forth and with full knowledge that you didn't choose to be here today. You didn't choose to be in the ministry. You didn't even choose to be saved. He called you. He convicted you. And He chose you. The enemy would, would have you compare your talents with someone else's. The enemy would tell you that you don't sing as good as someone else. That you don't play an instrument. Or that you don't play it as well as someone else. The enemy would tell you that you don't preach as good as someone else. God has in His furnishing you the tools needed to do the job that He has sent you out to do. And I had to chuckle earlier. It was the same thing that God showed me showed you. It's not important the size of the crowd that you're saying to. It's not important the size of the crowd that you preach to. The only thing that matters is are you doing what God has called you to do? Don't compare yourself to someone else's ministry. That's a trick of the devil. Don't do it. You do the very best that you can do. Prepare yourself he, he teaches us to prepare ourselves. I don't know the Word of God like this man sitting over here does. I'll promise you. He's a Bible scholar. But I know that my God has called me to a certain ministry. And I'm going to give it my very best. Amen. And neighbors, friends, relatives can, can uh, 
talk all they want to and say, man, they're crazy. <laughs> they're senior citizens and they're stepping out in an in a RV. <laughs> and uh, what are they doing? Grandma's, we're just being, being obedient to God. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So this morning, I want to uh, just simply encourage you. Even if you're working in a store somewhere, God's got you there for a reason. Yes. If you're in a bank, whatever your line of business is, you're still in the ministry. Amen. If your crowd is one at a time, Amen. you're still in ministry. Amen. Give it your all. Amen. Be the salt that God has called you to be. Let me encourage you. Start your mornings. The first word out of your mouth. If you're not already. Let it be praise to Him. Yes. 